Hello, Rock Solid Agents. I am Dan Rushan. Today, I am joined with a very impressive lady from North Los Angeles, Northern Los Angeles, who has the funnest name in the world, Miss Stephanie Bitaco. That's correct. All right, Stephanie, thanks for joining me. Absolutely. So Stephanie, so you've been in the real estate business for a long time, correct? Yes, over, it's been over 25 years. Okay, so for over 25 years and today, we want to learn a little bit about you and a little bit about like how in the heck have you stayed in business and a business that you and I, we wake up every single morning, we're unemployed, we don't have a paycheck. And how do you do that for more than 25 years? Like that's crazy. And so that's the conversation that we're going to have today. So Stephanie, so tell me a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your background, who you are, what you do, what are your interests, sure. those types of things. Sure. So, um, I have grown up in the Northern Los Angeles area. This is where I'm from. This is where I grew up. I'm in an area called the San Fernando Valley. And I started selling real estate over 25 years ago. And this is all I do. Got it. So 25, uh, more than 25 years ago when you got started in real estate sales, and that's longer than, you know, it's twice as long as, as I've been doing this. And I've seen eons of changes. Tell me about like day one. I mean, you know, that, that had to look very different than what it looks like today, right? It was not pretty. Day one was not pretty at all. Day two wasn't pretty. I don't know, maybe day 200 wasn't pretty. Okay. Um, like, like anything, it takes time. Um, I have been through three up markets. I've been through two horrific down markets. And I think the most important thing is that as soon as you start to get a little comfortable in the market, it changes and you have to stay ahead of it. You have to know your business. You have to learn your business, know your business, and then find a way to constantly stay very present in it, but be very cognizant of the changes that will come because the market goes in cycles yeah. and good market, bad market. You, for me, I want to be consistent regardless of what's going on around me and what the market's doing. And that can be hard to do in, in anything, especially real estate. So I'm assuming that you've had to employ different strategies, different techniques and tactics, depending on three up markets, two horrific down markets. How, tell me about, you know, like the first, when you started, was it up, was it down? Where was it? I'm assuming it was up, just I'm doing the math here. Sure, yes. So I got into the market uh, in the very late eighties and it was literally, it was just skyrocketing up and we literally peaked out and then it started to to go down. So I had a couple of years well, when I was really learning the business while it was up. And that was actually, um, it's actually better to learn in a bad market because when you learn in an up market, you really don't understand the, the how difficult it is because yeah. you, you write an offer, it gets accepted. I mean, there's different challenges in an up market. But I remember very clearly it was um, the market, you know, when, when the market starts to shift, there's not a bell that goes off. So you don't really know. It's just things start shifting around you. And I was at a client's house. I was sitting in his living room. And I remember to this day the house. And I went over all the data with him. And I said, okay, here's what your house is worth. And he said, he looked at me and he had this, this upset look on his face. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, well, I, I owe a lot more than that. And this was before short sales. And this was before people had that term. And I, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, very logical. I said, okay, well, let me give me the information for your lender. I'll call your lender because if he was just going to walk away. Oh, so yeah. I said, let me just talk to your lender and see what we can do. So I picked up the telephone and got somebody on the phone, which you can't do that anymore. And um, basically said to the person, listen, this guy needs to sell his house. He's ready to walk away. Uh, you know, can we work something out? And before I knew it, I was doing short sales, which then led into um, foreclosures. That bank, that gentleman that I was working with on the other end of the line was with one of the savings and loans at the time that is now completely defunct. But um, they ended up getting gobbled up by the uh, Resolution Trust Corporation when all the savings and loans went belly up. So because I had done a very diligent and thorough job, when the government stepped in, that gentleman at the bank said, hey, you should call this the taco girl to help you handle her asset, the assets because she's she's diligent. So my persistence and just having that opportunity, because you never know who your audience is. You never know when you're working with someone, 
how much of an impact they can have on you or have on your business. So that was that was a pivotal um, eye opener for me. What year was this, Stephanie? I think it was ninety one. Okay, so ninety one. So this was maybe ninety two before the term short sale was even. I mean, this was not in two thousand nine. This was no. <laughs> yeah. This was the peak. So in the late eighties, the market went up yeah. really high, and then it just in the beginning of the 90s when all the savings and loans went belly up that was the beginning of the end of that that was all the junk bonds with michael milken and charles keating and all of those guys and actually if you look at it the market just kind of reinvents itself because we've gone through similar things yeah. in the next cycles so when the market is bad i will do a lot of reo or foreclosure business and then i always do retail but I noticed very early on that the retail agents, when the market gets bad, they go away. They have no business or very little business. And then, of course, the for a lot of the REO agents, they don't want to do retail. So I do both. I straddle both sides of the fence. And so what I heard you say there was that you had a client, you remember the home that he was in and that you were in, and having that conversation and realizing my house is not worth as much as I owe on it. Well, let me make a phone call to the bank. And so what I heard you describe there is really persistence and solutions oriented was the yes. was the behavior that you embraced during that time. Is that correct? I am the daughter of a doctor of math. I was raised very analytical, very logical, very problem solving is uh, key. And that's uh, we apply that to our business every single day, because in real estate, I've said for years, real estate's a contact sport and every day you're getting hit by the ball. So you've got to be able to problem solve and see, see four steps out, five steps out to stay ahead of it. Yeah. And be persistent and consistent and, and, and yes. don't take no for an answer until right. I, you hear no 27 times, then maybe take it. Correct. Yes. <laughs> so, so Stephanie, so let's go back to, to consistency. So, um, so we've gone through this journey up, down, it's, you've evolved. You pivoted to the market. You've you, and and as you said, there's no bell, you know, that gets rung and says, "Okay, now change your, you know, change your tactics." So, how have you embraced that? I mean, like, you know, what have you done to pivot as the as the markets have changed? Because right now we're, you know, we're at the top of the market. We don't know yes. when it will shift. We we know what the next market will be. We just don't know when it will be. So. Um, Come to today, 2019, what should we be looking forward to in regards to preparation for the future? So I think there's two things, right? You always have to look, you have to look micro and you have to look macro. So I'm always looking at what is my current book of business looking like and then where where do I think it's going in the next, you know, 30, 60, 90 days, six months, a year. And it's about prospecting, it's about staying in touch with your clients and it's about keeping those relationships um, alive and and nurturing them and servicing them so that when the market does shift you're you're ready for it it's about reading and it's about staying on top of what's going on in the industry and and keeping your eyes open and it's, it's hard to do because we're so focused on the day-to-day -day stuff but yet you still have to be focused on the long-term things as well and what's going on around you because each market of course is going to be um, sensitive to that that area what's going on in the San Fernando Valley is going to be totally different than what's going on in Texas or, you know, New York. Yeah. One of the things that I've done is I've observed the California market most intentionally because I've observed through the last uh, waves is that it starts in California. I'm on the, I'm on the opposite side of the country as you. And so I'm really, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not, I'm paying as much attention to California as I am to my own market because that's, that's been a predictor in the past. Yep. It starts here and works its way. Yeah. So what, so, so be consistency. I mean, I really like just, I'm just amazed with this and I'm amazed with the fact that you've, you've gone through this for so many years. And so we talked about some of your behaviors and, and where do you get your business from? I mean, today we're, we're like, do you have a, you know, a certain book of business? How would you describe the, the ways that you get your business? So my business is from a lot of different facets, um, and I think that that's really important too. And in anybody that I've really followed or looked at or um, watched, you know, it's always interesting to me to watch other agents who do 
a similar type of volume of business to see what they do and learn from them as well. But it's, it's not any one area. It's past clients. It's referrals. It's other agents that refer me. It's networking. It's um, social. It's mailers. It's farming. It's all of it. It's the internet. It's, um, there's, there's not any one way, but it's just it, doing everything all the time consistently. And, and what is your volume of business? Um, dollar volume or number of sales or either. Both. So dollar volume is over a hundred million and then number of sales will vary in a retail market. It's um, 150 to 200 closings a year in a corporate market or a foreclosure market. It'll kick up to several hundred a year because you have volume from, from specific clients. Do you prefer one over the other? Um, I like them both actually. There's the pros and cons to, to both. You know, I like, um, the good thing about corporate business is although their um, metrics are very specific and you have to perform like this, there's no talking about why a house isn't selling. You're either, you either hit the numbers that you said and they judge you on that or you didn't. And if you don't hit it, you're fired. Um, but it's, it's, it's very intensive in a specific area, but there's not the same emotion that there is with retail. Retail is, you know, you're dealing with how someone, they're living in their house and what's going on. Usually people have, they're selling because um, death, divorce, loss of job, maybe they're moving up, maybe they're getting transferred, but these things are all compounding the largest the largest financial transaction of their life. So it can, I mean, I've said that after doing this for as long as I have, I should have an honorary degree in psychology. So, cause it's, it's very emotional for people. You're the, the nurse, the doctor, the psychologist, uh, just about everything, right? Yes, yes. You got to wear all the hats. That's right. The fireman sometimes. <laughs> yes, regularly. Yeah. So what I heard you say is that it's you know in a in a retail market in in a market that's that's appreciating or 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 flat at the top, then you would be. It's really more about. Uh, uh, listening. I mean, we were always listening, but but it's there's more emotion involved when when somebody is is selling a home. That's something that I've realized. I see if you agree with this is that a, a home seller or and a home buyer, for that matter, always have anxiety. You know, they're either yeah. losing a job, getting a job, concerned about their their kids' school, they're yeah. uh, concerned about that maybe they're divorcing, they're getting married, whatever the case may be. Yeah. And so. In the retail market, there's more of that. Yeah, which there's a ton of that. that. Yeah, am I understanding you correctly? Oh, completely. One of my favorite stories is I went over to a client's house. I was represent, representing them as their listing agent, and we were mid inspections, and there was all sorts of chaos. And it was, I don't know, it was maybe nine o'clock in the morning, and I went over there, and the woman, um, very nice couple, she was standing at the center island, and she said, "Oh, can I can I get you a cup of coffee?" I said, "No, I'm good." She said, "How about a bagel?" I said, no, I'm fine. And then she said, how about a half a Xanax? I'm having one. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll take two. <laughs> okay, well, you know, but do what you got to do. <laughs> oh, my goodness, yeah. True so story. what would you say to an agent? So you have, you know, you have a lot of um, momentum and a lot of different sources of business. And, and I know that you are 100% responsible for that. And you've developed that. And, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you today. And uh, agents that don't have that same, uh, you know, um, tenure in our business may not have as much of, of, of those funnels coming in. So what would you say to those agents? And I guess you have to sort of think back as you were developing this, yeah. like what strategies would you want to employ? How, how would you want to get from say 10 million of volume to 60 million of volume, for example, what would you do if, if you're, you know, mentoring that or coaching that person? So I think that, I think it's really important to know that any agent in my position didn't start this way, yeah, right? No. So we all start with nothing. Um, and I think it's a matter of setting up a plan and sticking to it. When I was a new agent, I was really, really young. I was really, really green. I didn't know the first thing about real estate. I didn't understand the, the even the basics of it and what I did is I just set up uh, a plan and I did whatever my broker told me to do so literally my day book my calendar had 
you know, a door knock every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 to 12. That was my appointment. I didn't have any appointments. I had nothing to do. I took, you know, I took floor time then when we had floor time to answer the phones, to take those calls. I sat open houses every weekend. I mean, I did the basics, right? Cold call, door knock, sit open houses. And as long as you do the basics, at some point, you're going to get momentum. But you have to do it consistently. And then also, when it starts to pick up, you can't take your foot off the pedal. You have to continue. Otherwise, it'll just you'll lose that momentum. You have to get past the breakwater. What was, uh, do you recall a ceiling in your business that you got stuck at? And then, you know, what was that and how'd you get through it? Sure. So um, I was maybe two or three years into the business and I was starting to get really busy. But I found that, you know, obviously you get the business and now you have to service the business. And that's very important <laughs> too. So I was literally, I mean, I was deemed a fire hazard in my own office because I had papers and stuff everywhere. They wouldn't give me a bigger space. They said, you get this teeny little cubicle. And this is not, this is before anybody worked from home or anything. So I just said, okay, fine. And I would literally work on the floor. I had all my files spread out all over everywhere. And they did the fire. They had the fire department come in to get me to, they said, you got to clean this stuff up, Stephanie. Cause I refused to, I refused to do it. Um, they ended up giving me more space. But more importantly was I was staying in the office until 12 o'clock or one in the morning to work on the files that I was the, for the business that I was creating. And a woman in my office who was twice my age, she came over to me. She was an agent and a lovely woman. And her, she was at a point in her life where she didn't have, she didn't want to do the the, she didn't have that tenacity that the business takes at that point in her life for what she was going through. And she basically stood over me as I was sprawled out on the floor one day and she had her hands on her hips and she looked down and she said, you need my help. And I said, I don't, I don't know how, how am I going to, you know, what, what are we going to do? How am I going to pay you? What if I don't do another deal? I can't afford you. And she said, look, let's just do this for 90 days. She needed a regular paycheck and I needed help. Um, I, again, I was very young, so I didn't have a business background. I didn't know how to structure a business. Nobody had assistance and teams. And so I said, okay, we'll do this for 90 days. And if at the end of 90 days it doesn't work, we're good. Well, she freed me up so much because she took care of all the paperwork and all the, all the stuff that you have to do that has really not – that doesn't have a direct impact on your business, but you have on, on generating business, but you have to do it to do a good job. So she helped me so much that we freed up so much time. And of course I didn't work less. I just kept doing more. And then we had to hire another person and another person until I learned how to structure a business. So, and she's still a, she's now, she's gotten out of the business, but she's still a client till this day and, and also a friend, which is nice. Cool. cool. So you, so you hit a ceiling. And then yep. you made a hire, yep. leveraged, yep. and then that allowed for you to focus on more money-making activities while those that were supporting you were able to focus on your 80%. Is that Correct. what I'm saying? Yes, yes, absolutely. And to help me service the, the files and deal yep. with all the problems that go along with every escrow that there is and all the craziness that goes on with that when you're trying to herd cats every day. Yeah. What is your team? What does your business look like today? So today I do have people that help me. I run my business like a business. Um, I'm really good with the selling of property. That's what I know how to do. That's what I'm really good at doing. Good at getting the property set up, pricing it correctly, making sure that we do the things to the home to maximize the price. And then I have a great group of people around me to help me do what I do. You know, there's so there's so much marketing and advertising and every deal there's so much that goes on and there's so many different people involved and you can't rely on the other side of the transaction to do what they're supposed to do. So we have systems in place to do their job basically. So do you segment that into like marketing, transaction coordinating, yes. buyer's agent, sales, lead generation? Right. Yes, absolutely. So it is, it's the marketing and then it's the, um, the transaction, the transaction coordinating and all of, all of that, support that goes into that and it's huge. It's a lot. There's a lot gotcha. that goes on in a deal. Gotcha. So if you were selling yourself because you have, you know, you've evolved through this, you know, you've gotten so much wisdom as as in this business as, as a business person, as well as a sales agent. And I'm sure that you've made mistakes in the past as well because 
I always, um, I always perceive the most successful. I perceive you as one of the most successful are also the, the biggest failures. I'm not calling you the biggest failure, by the way. <laughs> but okay. I, I, perce- I have this perception that those that reach high levels make more mistakes than those that don't. Would you? What are your thoughts about that? Oh, yeah. I've made a lot of mistakes, and that's how you, you know, you put your hand on the hot stove and you learn what not to do the yeah. next time. So, yes, I have. It's, it's like if you've been playing chess, thousands and thousands and thousands of games, right? You learn how to see eight steps out. You learn to do what, what to do, what not to do. And you can really, it's like anything else. You just, you really hone your skills and you perfect your craft if you do it every day, all day for years and years and, and dedicate yourself to it. And so there's always you, something. What would you say to that, Stephanie, that's starting today? Oh my gosh. <gasps> what would I say to her? Uh, I don't know. I'd say just give it time. Take a deep breath and give yourself time. You'll get there. <laughs> got it. Got it. How do you describe success? Um, doing, being able to do what you want to do. Being able to do what you want to do. So having the, the freedom within your time. Correct. Whether it's for me, I mean, one of my favorite sayings is work is only work if you'd rather be doing something else. So I don't really look at what I do as work. I like what I do. I like the action. I like, you know, meeting, I meet so many different people. I meet so many interesting people. It's really fascinating because when you think about it, as an agent, right, I'm inside their living room. I'm inside their dining room, whatever their house, dealing with their usually very intimate details of their life and again their biggest their biggest financial investment for the most time for the most part and um, just fascinating people of all walks of life and just to hear their stories and um, what they're going through I mean some some crazy stuff some stuff where I just have to keep a complete poker face some stuff that's just I think wow these people are amazing some sad stories I mean I, it's it's everything I could write a book yeah what, what brings you joy? Um, uh, I would say that when I have a client that I know I've helped, that I really maybe made a difference, at, at least when, when they're going through something difficult, and that I know that I've been able to add value to the situation and to be able to help them through a process that otherwise they could have gone down a rabbit hole or um, had other issues and I'm that I'm able to bring my knowledge and skill and say we need to do it this way and help them help them with the process Got it. help them with where they're going so being able to help those clients is 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 rewarding to you emotionally and and you don't see it as a job you see it as I don't. it's fun yeah, yeah so, every day yeah. most days <laughs> <laughs> I understand <laughs> what about what about what do you what are you afraid of what do you fear spiders um, <laughs> Um, I'm not. I'm not afraid of too many things, actually. Okay. Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, maybe the fear of not having enough time to be able to do everything that I want to do. Yeah. So that would maybe that's a fear. Got it. Right. What uh, do you do? You have a, a book that you give to other people often, or a book that you that you would recommend if you know whether it be business or real estate sales or, or personal development or anything like that? Any, anything like that that so, you recommend? Yes, it depends on the person, and I do like to give books to people, but it depends on the person. So if I have a client who's into art, I may give them a book on art. Um, I recently, I like I like books a lot, and I recently bought an amazing collection of books from um, a client of mine had passed away, and she had just some incredible books from the 1800s. And I found myself bidding against, at the estate sale, bidding against a, a book collector, and he had bid on the whole collection. So I was stuck bidding on the whole collection, even though I didn't want the whole collection. But within this collection, there was a wonderful book on psychology. So I gave it to my, one of my clients who's a psychologist. Or if it's animals, I'll, I'll maybe find a good book online for that client. So it really just depends. But I would say that there's, um, I mean, like business books are, are fantastic. There's a great book called, um, oh my gosh, what's it called? The, the Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer. And he's the guy who created WebMD. Fascinating okay. book of how he developed WebMD and became this incredible success. But it's half business and it's, it's read it. It's worth a read. 
It's worth the read. The Surrender Experience. Yes, The Surrender Experiment by Michael oh, Singer. Experiment. Excuse me. Thank you for letting me. Okay. The Surrender Experiment. By Michael Singer. WebMD okay. guy. All right, cool. Those I'm curious the 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 books from the from the 1800s. Yes. Can you tell me more about those? Oh, uh, they're so you get to read them or? So you know what this this is the part where where I wish I had more time. So this was actually several months ago, and they're in boxes in a room downstairs in my house, and I I just want to spend a few hours to go through them all. Um, they're mostly she was a I'm a big animal lover, and she was a um, she never had children, and she had dogs, and her whole life was dedicated to dogs and in fact when she passed she left most of her estate to specific um, animal organizations and these are she had just the most amazing collections or books that are just stunning and beautiful i will text you i'll send you some pictures they're they're amazing books but i need the time to go through them all and just enjoy them yeah that's cool i, I i'm very interested i mean i love to read as well and, and something like that's just a treasure you know, they're, they're pretty amazing. Well, Stephanie, um, I really appreciate your time today and, and, and sharing, you know, a bit of your wisdom. And if I'm a real estate agent watching this, because a lot of real estate agents watch this and I have somebody in northern Los Angeles that yeah. I know that wants to buy a home, invest in a home or invest in real estate, buy a home, sell a home or invest in real estate. How do I get in touch with you? Um, you can call me at my office, which is 818-576-1685, or my web address is stephanievitaco.com. That's kind of long, right? <laughs> but yeah, I'm in the San Fernando Valley or just the surrounding Los Angeles area. So we'll find you online, Stephanie Vitaco. Yes, that's me. Thanks, Stephanie. I appreciate you, and please let me know how I can ever help you in any way. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye.